Good morning, Holy Comforter. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here on this Labor Day weekend. It's a beautiful day. I have a few announcements to make. I'm Barry Pascal. I'm your uh, vestry person today. That's not an announcement. Uh, we have a lot of things to sign up for out in the foyer. Uh, Jenny Quibodeau will be out there uh, after church selling tickets to uh, Oktoberfest. You can get those from her. We also have sign-ups for dinner church, for refreshments after church, for koinonia, and for dinner church. All those things are coming up. So a lot of things to visit in the foyer when you go out. Make sure you look out for those. Uh, any other announcements are in the bulletin. Be sure to look out for those. And if you would, please silence your cell phones and prepare your hearts for worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. power and might, the author and giver of all good things. Grant in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good words. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take anything away from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God, with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, 
For this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call on him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would please join me in reading Psalm 15. The psalm shall be read responsibly by whole verse. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill? Whoever leads the land of and does There is no guile upon his tongue. He does no evil to his friend. He does not heap contempt upon his neighbor. In his sight, the wicked is rejected, but in the arms of the superior Lord. <coughs> he has sworn to do no wrong and does not take back his word. Whoever does these things shall never be overthrown. A reading from the letter of James. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, in their distress keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. Of your hearts and hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Lord, 
Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon, you abandon the commandment of God and hold the human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. But it is from within, from the human heart, that all evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the gospel of our Lord. <laughs> Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Creator, and Jesus the Christ, Lord and Savior, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you folks for a few minutes this morning about our good news lesson from St. Mark's Gospel and about being distracted. A couple weeks ago, Pam and I spent Monday evening in Charlotte before flying out on a direct flight home to Maine the following morning. So on the way, we stopped to have an early dinner at our favorite restaurant from when we were stationed at Fort Jackson in Columbia, South Carolina, um, rest in, Restaurant San Jose on Killian Road. It's a, it's a Tex-Mex place, and uh, we just love that place. But the only customers in the restaurant at that time were Pam and myself, and directly in front of me, in my line of sight, sitting across from me were a mother and her son who looked to be about 10, or 11 years old. They were both on their phones the entire time, even while eating, hunched over, disconnected, in the same place, but worlds apart. And I shared with Pam, that is heartbreaking, as well to me as poor parenting, that they will never get that moment back. They're in the same place with an opportunity to connect, but they are a world apart. Rather than be present and in the moment, they were distracted. Only this kind of distraction goes even deeper because the brains of a generation are addicted to the dopamine hit the phone provides and unable often to deal with adversity without becoming frustrated, angry, and sadly these days, suicidal. They are distracted as are many adults, many of their parents. And I don't blame the kid at the restaurant. Frankly, I hold the mother responsible distracted and distractions. In our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah. He talks about the way God looks at the human heart. God sees the ways we become distracted by appearances and human traditions that fall short 
of connecting us to what truly matters. In the gospel this morning, the religious leaders are criticizing Jesus and his followers because they don't follow the tradition of washing their hands before they eat. For us, we wash our hands because it's simply good hygiene. In the world of Jesus, folks wash their hands before eating is a simple of ritual washing and cleansing. It was a boundary marker which identified them as God's people. Much like the way many of us make the symbol of the cross on our foreheads, lips, and hearts when the gospel is read. This reminds us that the gospel of Jesus is to be kept on our minds, on our lips, and in our hearts. It's a tradition. It's like confession. Everyone can, but no one must. It is easy to mistake the appearance of something for the thing itself. Jesus and his followers are criticized for eating with defiled hands. The rule not to eat with defiled hands is a kosher law. Jesus challenges those who challenge him when he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Jesus is telling them that their focus, while well-intended, is off course. They fail to truly honor God because even while holding to human tradition, it is the heart that matters to God. The heart, the self, and communion with and in relationship to and with God and others. You know, we live in a time in the world where it's easy to be distracted. Um, we can amuse and distract ourselves to death. Right now, the average American spends four hours and 37 minutes on their phone and 2.7 hours watching TV. We spend on average over the course of our lifetime, I, I just read this, $250,000 on grooming and beauty products, and an average of one hour a day on actual grooming. I'm in an age where it takes me about five minutes, just <laughs> shower, comb the hair, and go. <clears throat> but I wonder how much time do we spend in quiet prayer? How much time do we spend with God? In 2024, regular attendance at church is considered once a month. That is one hour a month. And the other things I talked about are fine. I, you know, I don't share all that to guilt trip anyone. Simply to ask and prayerfully ponder if we can direct and undistract our hearts from other things to God for more than one hour a month. What if we first spent time on what matters most and refreshed all the other things while helping us keep them in perspective? on growing in grace, following Jesus, having our hearts and will shaped around God's will, freeing our souls and time and energy with the things of God. We can get so focused and so distracted on and by the external stuff, the fleeting stuff, important stuff, forgetting that grass withers and flower fades, that we forget to spend time in prayer, ignoring our deepest spiritual gifts, which in turn can lead to deep and meaningful, meandering, floundering, and lost. That's why, to me, one of the downsides of the decline of church attendance in our country, and I realize that churches are often part of that problem, one of the downsides is the loss of community people experience, which is presenting itself in increasing anxiety, loneliness, depression, death by suicide, and people finding belonging in tribalism and in their own partisan political leanings. There's an ancient Chinese saying, you can't measure the sea with a pot, which is like saying you can't judge a book by its cover. Both typically fail. God is interested in the heart, not just words or by mere appearances. In the Jewish tradition, Jesus was raised in, the heart is viewed as the seat of the will, one's being, and not just the place of emotion. In order to align our hearts with God's will and purpose, we begin by getting our ego out of the way, on bended knee, asking for grace, in and with humility, remembering that our hearts are restless until they rest in God, saying and praying, not my will, but yours be done. That calls for us to let go of other things which distract us from God and others, even if that is a tradition, something which provides us a sense of order and belonging in a chaotic and uncertain world. Letting go of the distractions moves us to embrace the truth that when our heart shines with love for God and others, that then we know beauty and success. Our lives experience ultimate meaning and purpose when we keep 
human tradition in perspective. Once our heart is focused on God's will and purpose, life becomes worth living, filled with value, dignity, hope, and joy, regardless of your circumstance. God will not be fooled. We can fool others. We can fool ourselves, but not God. God calls for more than lip service. God calls us to a living faith, one which practices the way of, one which follows Jesus, one which calls us to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, to do as Jesus did. God wants all of us. God wants all of you. God wants your heart. You know, three weeks ago, this parish, along with a couple others, took part in um, Undy Sunday. So between a handful of parishes, we donated over 3,000 pair of new underwear for homeless and working poor folks in downtown Augusta. Being served by Father Larry Jeshin and his wife Pam at the Billsby Center, a church without walls on Green Street. That is what having a heart for God and others looks like. If you have, if we have a heart and it's beating in your chest, then Jesus is speaking to us this morning when he tells us that what defiles us is what comes out of the heart. And that the finger that might, be pointing, might point at others first needs to point at ourselves. We're all good at scapegoating and blaming others, and we would rather agree that the words of Jesus are not directed at us. We would rather turn our grace somewhere else than inward, looking deep within, sitting for a moment, honestly discerning our own hearts, <coughs> souls, and lives. Maybe that is why so many don't, are so distracted, because they don't want to do that work. Because they might find, as the Russian writer and novelist um, whose works I read in college who chronicled the brutality of the labor camps in the former Soviet Union, Alexander Solzhenitsyn once said, the line between good and evil runs not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but through every human heart. That line runs through your heart, and it runs through my heart. There was one person with a heart who walked among us, and his heart was large. It was not small or mean or petty or vindictive. It did not demean, diminish, or name call. It was a heart firm and soft at the same time. It was a kind and compassionate heart, a heart which beat for the orphans and the widows, as we heard about in our lesson from St. James. His heart beat for the beaten up and beaten down, those on the ragged and jagged edges of life, those who grieve, those who feel forgotten, for all of us when we forget that we have been given hearts for in the first place. The heart of Jesus, because it was soft and tender, fleshy, alive with God, pulsating and beating with love, the heart of Jesus broke over and over again. It broke and it breaks when he sees how we treat one another, when people are marginalized, othered, made visible, invisible. The heart of Jesus breaks when we elevate human tradition, above the commandment of God, which are love of God, love of self, and others. It breaks the heart of Jesus when we hide our light under a bushel basket with un unhealthy and destructive self-talk. It breaks the heart of Jesus when we judge others as well as ourselves. The heart of Jesus broke in a garden in the middle of the night before he was crucified at the hands of the Romans. His heart broke in death. It broke and broke and broke and breaks and breaks and breaks. But when the heart of Jesus broke and breaks, it does not harden. Jesus held his condemnation for those with hard hearts. The heart of Jesus did not and does not shrink and shrivel. It grows and grew in love. The heart of Jesus expands in grace and compassion. The heart of Jesus swells in generosity, goodness, and virtue. The heart of Jesus breaks like water, a ripple, a trickle at the headwaters of a river of love. The heart of Jesus breaks like a loaf of bread, Divided, but enough for all. The heart of God in Jesus breaks for and with our hearts and for all those whose hearts ache and break. The ultimate breaking of God's heart is the death and resurrection of Jesus. At the cross and empty grave, we die to ourselves and we come alive in and through Jesus. Broken hearts will not have the last word. Hard hearts will not have the last word. Mourning and tears and injustice will not have the last word. Death will not and does not have the last word. The heart of God is the last word, and it is hearts, new hearts, soft hearts, kind hearts, large hearts, full of life, wonder, sacrifice, joy, light, virtue, grace, and compassion. Those are the hearts God is seeking. 
I'll close with a quick story. This is a true story. I'm not sure it ever happened, but it's true. <laughs> so one day the abbot, the leader of a monastery, was standing with a friend at the top of a tall tower. His friend looked down at the road and saw a group of the abbot's monks all wearing their monks' habits and they were walking towards them. Look, said the friend, holy men. Those aren't holy men, the abbot said, and I can prove it to you. So they waited in silence until the monks were walking directly below the tower. The abbot leaned over the tower's rail and called down, hey, holy men. The monks all looked up and the abbot turned to his friend and said, see, they weren't holy men because they looked up and they were called out as holy men. There is only one place to look and see how good and holy we are, and that is in the heart of Jesus, who fills us with grace upon grace upon grace. The one whose grace fills our hearts and calls us to remember, not my will, but yours be done. Amen? Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are danger, are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the presence, uh, for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Sean, our presiding bishop elect, Frank, our bishop, Glenn, our priest and all other bishops and ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, for those in need of healing, Dr. Llewellyn Powell, Kathy Stewart Jackson, Hunter Baker, Lou Scales, and Kelly Hill. For those who are homebound, for the safety of Joseph Haddo and all who serve abroad. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, for those with special celebrations, for those celebrating birthdays, Nicole Williams, Jason Schmick, Susan Porterfield, for those of celebrating anniversaries, Thomas and Joy Cook, Bill and Sarah Liebel. Thanksgiving for our outreach partners. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. 
We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Andrew Scholes, Bill, Joe Bill White, and Aaron Thompson. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins as we share the confession and absolution. <clears throat> Merciful God. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Now remember to share the peace with those joining us online. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace of Christ.
All things come from you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. The night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us all so that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through our son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. <clears throat> so come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. <clears throat> you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come because it is the Lord who invites you. It is the Lord's will that those who desire Jesus should meet him here at this table. Alleluia, Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Please be seated. You're all invited and welcomed and wanted at our Lord's table. If you come forward, I'll give you the bread, the body of Christ. If you go to the right, you can drink from the common cup. If you go to the left, you can dip the bread into the wine. The meal is prepared, the table is ready. Come and receive Jesus.
Will you stand? <clears throat> we share together the post-communion prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and to serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a few brief announcements. This Wednesday at 8.30, from 8.30 to 9.30, will be the ramblings with the rector down in the street of Dunkin' Donuts. Just come by if you have any questions you want to ask me about the church, theology, life, whatever. It's just a chance to have coffee, uh, get to know each other a little better. The, um, there is a women's retreat, uh, Daughters of the King retreat coming up. Saturday, September 10th, 7th, from 10 to 2. Saturday, September 7th, from 10 to 2. Uh, Tuesday, June 16th. I had too much wine. Um, <laughs> Tuesday the 10th, we'll have active shooter training here at the church at 6.30. Um, God forbid we need it, but it's good to have that training. It'll be an hour-long training. It's free uh, Tuesday the 10th at 6.30 here at the church. Our next dinner church will be Thursday, September 19th. Uh, it's a potluck dinner, so bring something to eat. Um, and I'll be doing a little training on suicide prevention and awareness uh, that evening. And, um, and then Thursday, September 12th, is the next opportunity to pack meals at the master's table. Uh, ten folks showed up this Friday. I wasn't able to be there, but we had a good crew from the church. And uh, so the next opportunity is 9 to noon on Thursday, September 12th. Um, so please let me know if you're interested in that. Always remember how short life is and how little time we have to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
of the children down. Alleluia, alleluia, and let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. 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 Good job, guys.